Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. Coming up, a new knife from Kombu. I get a new knife from Finch Knives and 10 slim and slender folders uh, from my collection that I want to talk about. Uh, all of that coming up. But before we get to anything, even the pocket check, I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Um, uh, I really appreciate it. I know there are, there's a good number of people out there who uh, who spend their time on this show. And I just want you to know that Jim and I appreciate it because we put a lot of work into it and and we love doing it. And uh, we love that there are people out there who spend their time on it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching and listening. And uh, there's more great stuff to come. All right. So first, I want to talk about what I have been carrying today. This, of course, is the pocket check. All right. So today I have a special, uh, well, a couple of special knives on me. But this first one is special because uh, I was one of the first people to get this knife. This is the Attention to Detail Mercantile Mark I. This is a large with that beautiful full-handled um, natural tan canvas micarta inlay. Uh, this is a really, I love this knife. To me, I put this knife on the shelf with uh, Strider, with uh, Hinderer, with, um, you know, the, the Sebenza type knives. Like, this is a big, sturdy, solid titanium knife. And it has some of the aesthetics of those older, classic, uh, uh, tactical, hard-use knives. I, I, I can't believe I'm calling Strider older and classic, but you know what I mean. It kind of it kind of fits in that box. Now, this I am not going to pretend this is one of his very first specimens that he produced. I'm not going to pretend that this is up to the quality of those um, those knives. But since making this one of his, this is, I think, his third or fourth. It was it was in the first bunch of knives that he made uh, of folders. And now, you know, checking out his work at Blade Show, it is very refined at this point. You know, everything's on bearings. Everything is smooth. Everything is. Uh, he's really refined his process here. It there was a bit of um, I don't want to say experimentation. Well, it was experimentation. He was he was new to this uh, folding frame lock game. I saw that inlay, and I just had to have it. It was after one of our um, one of our uh, town halls here, and uh, called him up after the town hall, and I said I have to have it, <laughs> and so I do, and I love it. Um, there are a couple of couple of things I would like. Uh, about a newer one, like the bearings, for instance, uh, they would make that sharp and pointy flipper tab a little uh, more palatable. Uh, but on the whole, to me, I feel very lucky to have this. This is like a, uh, the tattoo on my forearm. It's a early example of a very, um, you know, famous, well-known and accomplished tattoo artist. But when he did my arm tattoo, he was brand new at it. And every time I've seen him since, he look at it and say, oh, I had such a heavy hand. Let me fix it. And I'm like, no, this is an early dot, dot, dot. It's a Dan Hank. This is an early Dan Hank, and uh, I'm keeping it. So that's how I feel about this uh, Mark II. It does have some refinements that you'll see in later uh, later versions of this, but I have one of the early ones. So I feel, I feel privileged about that. Okay, next in my left pocket is the slip joint of the day. And today it is the... Great Eastern Cutlery number 86. This is not the current 86. This is the one they were doing right before. So now they have uh, the cattle, cattleman's knife, I think it is. And the main blade is a sheep's foot. And the secondary blade is a nice long pen blade. Uh, this is, I think they called this the oil field jack. Is that right? Because um, they do one version of this with that wood that uh, oil sucker wood i think it was called they used it as a dipper rods to see how deep the well would go how much oil was in the well and uh great eastern cutlery came across a whole you know a cache of this wood that's been used for that and it's already impregnated with oil so it's sort of stabilized and um uh, and they made uh they made the 86 with that handle with the big wrench um shield well they also made a number of others and you know uh, if you've watched this show for any length of time, you know I love autumn jig bone. I love this this coloration. So when I saw that they released this knife in this pattern, I sought it out and I found it. This was a secondary market purchase, I believe. 
either that or now I just don't remember. I may have found some obscure website that actually had one waiting around and got it. So awesome. Um, I'm going to go to this, uh, to the mic for a second so you can hear the walk and talk. I'm not so sure how that translates. Walk and talk is not just how it sounds, but it's also how it feels. It's a, it's a sensory blend, you know, of tactile and, and audi auditory. Um, and well, visual, because sometimes you get to see the blade do its little half stop um, Wiley Coyote move. Uh, so anyway, um, the main blade on this one is the uh, clip point. I love that clip point. It's almost recurved, which allows for years of sharpening um, and getting, you know, keeping it straight after years of sharpening. It's got the machine ground swedge and the long pull. Uh, this is in the fancy titty -ute trim. You know, Great Eastern Cutlery has a couple of different trims uh, to, you know, designating the, the level of fit and finish and, and fanciness and cost. And uh, the unexcelled line is, is, their, is their high end or one of their high ends because they also do. Uh, oh, and sorry. Secondary blade right here is an awesome sheep's foot. Now, Great Eastern Cutlery does such a great job with their secondary slash smaller blades their uh, pen blades, their sheep's foot blades, their coping blades, they're all really, and, and their uh, spay blades, when they're smaller, it's not like they're throwaway items that they just stick in there, um, which I feel sometimes with some case knives and even some Rough Riders, I've felt like the smaller blades are, are less considered. But on these Great Eastern Cutleries, the smaller blades are very well considered and they're long and they're really nice. Uh, and, you know, for the, the price you're going to pay for a Great Eastern Cutlery, it should be you know? Um, but these are the finest. I love these things. Finest production slip joints, I think. Not that I've tried every production slip joint, but I just love them because of their traditional um, lineage. Love them. Speaking of traditional lineage, so that's my pocket check. Let me know what your pocket check is by leaving a comment below or call the listener line 724-466-4487. Leave us a message. Um, but don't ask for Antonio. He's not taking any more appointments. He's booked through February. Okay, that being said, uh, we're talking about classic knives, and we're talking about old school knives. And uh, before we head on to Life Knife News, or Knife Life News, I always get that wrong, uh, I want to show you a knife that a, a colleague gave me. Uh, this is a guy at work. I don't work with him, but he's in an office nearby, and uh, he's been gone he was like, oh, pandemic, I'm never coming back to work. I'm just, <laughs> just going to telework. So recently he's been forced to come back and I've been seeing him and he's a, he's a cool guy. He used to inspect, uh, incidentally, he used to inspect nuclear um, power plants. Uh, I thought that's interesting because um, he's a pretty cool and casual guy. You wouldn't expect that. Uh, I would expect those guys to be really bundled up. Any case, um, I came in, I saw him at, in the office. Hey, man, how you doing? We were talking for a few minutes. He's like, I found this. He's always showing me these uh, old knives. And he pulled this one out. He's like, my mom got this for me. Do you remember this knife? And I said, no, I don't remember this one in particular. But I do remember um, this style of knife in the 70s and 80s. And, um, you know, this was a very famous uh, lockback knife that was in the back of a lot of magazines. Uh, at the time, ladies, uh, women's home journal to the comic books to, uh, you know, life magazine, those kind of things. And uh, my buddy Carl at work said that one year, I don't know, 1977 or something like that, his mom bought him, his brother and his father, all this lockback pocket knife, just a cheap back of the magazine pocket knife. And, you know, he was kind of, you know, he, he handed it to me like, oh, isn't this a cheap old piece of crap? And I was looking at it and I was like, this is actually pretty cool. I mean, there are a lot of issues with it. Over the years, the plastic uh, handle with that glorious and resplendent eagle has shrunk away from that copper. And, you know, the fit and finish is sort of atrocious. I mean, look at the look at the grind here versus the grind here and all of this stuff. It is not like the most uh, it does not have all the modern hallmarks of fit and finish that we've come to expect, even from cheap knives. Uh, so this is a real, this is a true classic. But looking at this, the first thing I did was smell it <laughs> before I even looked at the blade tang. I'm like, this is from Pakistan. And I smelled it and I was like, mm, it doesn't smell like Pakistan. 
uh, Pakistani knives, that is. They all smell like brass to me. Um, so I took a look, and it is a Japanese-made knife. Um, and, uh, well, I took this from him, long and short of it is. I took it from him. I'm going to clean it up, sharp, sharpen it, and, and give it back to him like it's a new knife. Uh, but the cool thing is, it's from Japan. And this is from an era when, uh, I don't know if you're old enough to remember this, but back in the day, we used to say, oh, the whole world is made in Japan. It was this sort of post-World uh, post War II um, it, you know, ex industrial explosion in Japan. And we were, it, it was like the China of the old days. We were exporting a lot of cheap goods from Japan. And a lot of it was crappy. Uh, and then Japan kind of came up in the 80s and their quality skyrocketed. And, uh, and then China came up behind it as the place to get cheap crap. And now China is making really awesome stuff, but still for cheap. So this, this is, <laughs> this is a very interesting knife. I, I like having it because it's a, it's an historical marker. And then also at the time, this was sort of state of the art for the lock back for the, for the locking folder, you know, um, standing on the shoulder of the buck 110, 112 type knife. A lot, a lot, a lot of companies made Buck 110, 112 style uh, knives. You know, Buck had something going and everyone else wanted in on it. So that's what this represents. This is a, a cheap knife from the back of the magazine in the 1970s. But man, it, and, it, it, and it was at the time considered a kind of a cheap knife. But I got to say, all these years out, 40 years out, 45 years out, there is no blade play. This thing is rock solid and actually it's still pretty sharp. You can tell it wasn't really cared for much. It was just sort of, you know, banged about. And, uh, but this, this cheap old Japanese knife is a high quality product. I got to say, uh, like I said, some of the materials have shrunk with time. That means they aren't, they weren't the best plastics or whatever they were using. Uh, but the, the structure is sturdy and the blade is sharpenable. So pretty, pretty interesting. A uh, little little view back into history. My grandfather, uh, my grandpa, my mom's dad, uh, in his later years, uh, uh, fell victim to a lot of sort of, or 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 was susceptible to to scamming. You know, like people calling up and being like, "Oh, I want to sell you this thing and that." And he got really into buying me a whole bunch of these collector edition Franklin Mint knives, and I have a whole bunch of them. And they remind me a little bit of this, except they're less usable. And to me, they are just uh, remembrances of my grandfather and how he was thinking of me. Oh, my grandson loves knives. Look at all these knives. So he would get these Franklin Mint packages and, uh, you know, wolf knives and eagle knives and motorcycle knives and all that kind of stuff. So interesting to have. This reminds me of that, just a higher quality version. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for listening uh, to that trip down memory lane. Um, yeah. That's that's part of this knife thing. It does bring nostalgic. Uh, it is a nostalgic hobby. It does bring memories back. Uh, so if you think what we do here is valuable, you want to help support the show, check us out on Patreon. We just did a knife giveaway. <clears throat> we do one every month uh, for the high, highest tier supporters. Those are the gentleman junkies. We have at $3 a month, the traditional junkie. At $5 a month, the traditional junkie. And at $10 a month, the gentleman junkie. And now uh, every month... Thursday, third Thursday of the month on Thursday Night Knives, we do a giveaway. We just did one. And this month, it was a budget bundle giveaway. Uh, we're giving away a slip joint, a Rough Rider, uh, micarta, blue micarta work knife, a petrified fish, which is an awesome, very inexpensive flipper, and uh, and the Mora, uh, a Mora Companion in blue. And then, and then on top of that, you can put it all in the 511 kit. Uh, it's like a little... Um, EDC zipper kit that we're giving away. So all of that's on Patreon. Uh, so for 10 bucks a month, you get thrown into that um, uh, giveaway bin, but also you get extras to the interviews, all the interviews. We do extras now. And if you're a Patreon member, you get to see that and stickers and other stuff. So join us on Patreon. The quickest way to do it is to head over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, in case you've forgotten, it's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. We just had Gregor Gr Grabarski on the show. And I, I do apologize for the pron pronunciation. Polish is a beautiful language. If you haven't heard it, check out some 
Christoph Kieslowski movies uh, from the 90s. Uh, you'll see some beautiful women speaking beautiful Polish, and it's awesome. Uh, also, like, hacking through some existential crises, so it's not all just beauty. Uh, but uh, we had Gregor Grabarski on the show, and his name does have a lot of zhs and rolled r's that I just cannot do. Uh, so, excuse me. But we, he is known as Kambu, and he is uh, an, a, a designer that makes these biomechanical sort of botanical beautiful knives uh, those are those are the adjectives I use to describe his design style. But he is now exclusively designing knives for Best Tech. He just came out with this one. This is his newest and smallest knife, and it's called the Nuke. And I love it. It's got such character. It's got kombu character. You look at the handle. You know that this is a Grabarski handle because of all of those, excuse me, gestural lines and swoops and swirls milled into the titanium. And then, of course, you see a really nice uh, inlay there that will either be G10 or carbon fiber uh, with this model. It also comes blacked and stonewashed, etc. But I'm just looking at this model. It is a, a perfect continuation for Kombu. Uh, it's like the perfect companion knife to his one that came out right before this called the uh, uh, um, No Guard. The No Guard. It's this really stylish bellied worn cliff uh, with same you know requisite swirls and swoops and and gestural lines in the handle and with this really broad worn cliff blade that has some interesting curves to it now it's called no guard and i thought oh that sounds very vikingish this must be a tip of the hat to the sax uh and worn cliff background and no no guard is dragon backwards. So that was, <laughs> I, I made some assumptions. But if you look at this knife, the nuke next to the dragon, if you're the type of person who will carry uh, two knives of the same brand, same lock type, same steel, same designer, they would make awesome companion pieces. You know me, I have these weird sort of neurotic rule about knife carry, and I would never carry the no guard with the nuke. But if you're a, a matchy matchy kind of person, this would be perfect. Uh, it's, it is, uh, all, all of that said, uh, it is a beautiful little utility knife. It's got a, 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 a nice big choil up front. So any sort of, um, any sort of finger room that you might miss from the short handle is made up in that choil. Looks like an awesome knife. Best tech, uh, makes great knives uh, from their very, very lowest to their very highest. Everything they do that I've experienced is awesome. They do a lot of OEM work, uh, that I've experienced and it's great stuff. So uh, if you like, this is all long for saying, if you like the design, you know that Best Tech, uh, Best Tech knocked it out of the park with execution, fit and finish and build. So check it out. Uh, really like uh, Gregor Grabarski and Kambu, very nice guy, very cool guy and very interesting uh, in conversation um, to match the design of his knives, don't you think? So Kambu, gotta get me a Kambu design in the, uh, in the collection here excuse me, very coffee oriented uh, day. Okay, next is Burnside Knives. Now you may remember Burnside Knives. We've done a couple of stories right here on the midweek supplemental about Burnside Knives. We talked about their first knife, the Cabrillo, which was this big uh, um, multi-ground, that's not the word I'm looking for. Um, uh, well, it's a big recurve sort of tanto with a, with a lot of different grinds. What do we call that? The... Um, <laughs> Damn, I know you're yelling at your your computer screen or your radio right now, but um, it's a compound ground blade. Uh, it was very big. They came back with the Cabrillo 2.0, which slenderized it down a bit. And um, now they've come out with this. Okay, so Burnside Knives, they, they, they took a break. We talked about them here for a while. I was kind of excited about their knife, the Cabrillo 2.0. And then we didn't hear anything from them for a while. Um, and But now they are back with this very unique knife called the Rose. Now, we showed this knife on Thursday Night Knives last week and talked about it, and it was a polarizing design. Some people really thought it was cool and unique. Obviously, it's unique, but some people thought it was, uh, it, you know, a welcome uh, departure from some of the more typical designs that are out there right now. And uh, so this is in the, uh, well, the, there's the blade right there. Thank you, Jim. That and I get why it's polarizing. I look at that blade and I, th I think it's kind of cool. It's a, 
It's an Americanized tanto with a very long forward portion, a drop point. The, the, the point is center line right down the pivot. It's got a weird cutout in the middle of the blade. It's got a, I mean, everything about this is unique. So I think this is going to be yet another polarizing design for birds, burn side knives. And I, th I think that if they changed the materials, it would be less polarizing. It's a VG10 blade. Fine. VG10 is a good steel. Uh, we have it on our, on our, uh, you know, Indellas and Enduras and Delicas and such. It's a good steel. G10 handle. It's got a clip that's very evocative of the Something Obscene Company clip, you know, the lightning strike. Um, so I feel like, I feel like with the materials they're doing it in, they might have a hard time with this knife. I'm going to be 100% honest. Uh, it's it's unique enough in design that if they threw M390 at it and marbled carbon fiber and the Timascus clip, they could probably charge a lot of money for it because it's a unique, weird looking knife. OK, but it's a unique, weird looking knife in some very pedestrian materials, which makes it almost a gas station knife. I, I hate to say this, and I, I would love to talk to Burnside about this. And, and, and that's a huge insult, actually. I don't mean it like that. It's not, it's, it, it's not a gas station knife. I don't mean it like that. I mean, it's taking chances that they need to go all the way with. Uh, they need to be 100% in with the chances they're taking with this by putting premium materials behind it. And then we'll believe it. <laughs> you know what I mean? That sounds crazy. But uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to censor myself on that. But I, I, all that being said, I like the design of the blade. And I like the only thing I don't like design wise is the clip. Um, I don't like the clip, the lightning clip on the something obscene company knives either. Just not my taste. It also seems like it might be uh, might have some practical issues coming in and out of the pocket with those with those abrupt angles on it. But uh, Burnside Knives Rose, they are a an Oregon based company, so I, I want to see them succeed, and and I, I hope that this is a good crossover for them because it might just uh, be the thing that someone who's got you know hundred bucks in their pocket wants to you know, put some differentiation in their, in their high value knife collection. So Burnside Knives, let's see more from you. And I I want to, I want to see this. Uh, I want to see this knife out in the wild. All right. Still to come state of the collection. We're going to take a look at a new Finch knife. Oh, actually, before we move on, let, let's take a look. So the knife here on, uh, on the, on the left closest to my face is the first one, the Cabrillo. That was a very large, that was a I think that was a uh, an over four inch bladed knife. They got the right. Yeah, uh, it's a four inch uh, knife. This was their first knife out of the gate. They sort of got the clue that most people want a shorter knife. So they came out with the Cabrillo 2.0, which retains some of that uh, some of that multi ground uh uh, you know, the, the multi-ground surface. I don't know why I'm not able to remember the name when you put two different grinds on a blade, but it retains that. It adds the hole in the blade. This is the second one from the left. And uh, so this was their sort of follow-up to that in a smaller package. And now they're coming out with the rose and that, uh, that really uh, seals the deal that they're going towards a more mm, EDC-friendly uh, output. Not for nothing, I've never heard anything about that 001 Strauss on the next line down, but that looks like a cool knife. So Burnside, let's hear from you. Let's hear from you. Maybe we bring you on Thursday Night Knives and talk to you. Find out what you're doing. And you're doing some cool stuff with this letter opener uh, slash unboxing knife, too. So Burnside Knives, people. Keep your eye out. Okay, still to come on the Knife Junkie Podcast Midweek Supplemental. I'm gonna We're going to take a look at a new Finch knife. And then we're going to take a look at 10, sl 10 slim and slender knives. These are folders that, to me, I, I carry when I need something a little bit less in the pocket. Like when I'm wearing my skinny jeans. I know you all want to see that. All right, coming up next on the Knife Junkie Podcast. 
The GetUpside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. GetUpside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. So the Upside app is no joke, actually. Uh, some of my favorite podcasts that are way, way huger than this one uh, are, get, are advertising Get Upside app, and people are coming back, people who drive a lot, and I drive a lot. I, I don't know why I'm not using this. I will. Uh, people who drive a lot are getting like 200 bucks a month from this. Uh, if if you're like me, you have a car that that is very thirsty, and you're driving all the, all the time because you're a father or you work far away or whatever or mother, um, check out Get Upside app. All right. Anyway, next. Uh, th that was totally unsolicited. I, I just do think it's a it's a it's a pretty cool uh, service. All right. State of the collection. I got a package totally unexpected from Spencer Marquardt of uh, Finch Knives. Spencer and Steve, awesome guys behind Finch Knives. We've done a couple of interviews here on the show. We've also had them on. Um, we had them on the birthday bash. Great guys. Their their whole thing is this. Uh, they're outdoorsmen and they love and collect classic slip joint knives. Pardon me. But they love modern flippers. So they are taking the, the aesthetic of these classic slip joint knives and translating them into modern day flippers through their modern day brains. And I have a nice collection of Finch knives. I'm actually only missing two at this point, the Takuna and the um the cherry bomb i have to get the cherry bomb i might have to get two one in the red bone for my wife and one in the uh, dark swirl uh acrylic for me but anyway uh they're one of their latest knives just out they have two two out uh the harvester and the drifter i was going to show you both but i left the drifter on my desk at work and god i hope the cleaning staff doesn't have a taste for cool little uh flipper knives. Uh, but I'm going to show you the Harvester. This is such a beautiful knife. Here it is in all of its glory. The Harvester, as you can see, is a really nice flipper design. It's got uh, it's got a really aggressive sheep's foot blade. And, and that's funny. You don't think of aggressive and sheep's foot blade in the same in the same line together. But I'll show you why I say it's aggressive. I'm going to line the spine of the knife and the spine of the handle, which are, you know, contiguous along this straight line here. And then look at the line of the edge. Oh, yeah. It is an aggressive angle from, uh, of the edge to the handle. This is like a Golok from the Philippines. This is like a, <laughs> it's like a war machete, the way it's set up. And, and what, what does that really mean? How does that translate into practical use? Obviously, you're not going to be using this uh, Finch Harvester as a war machete, uh, but fantastic in pull cuts because of that angle down. Uh, it, it, it is already, without even moving the knife, it is presenting the, ang the cutting edge uh, to the material at a positive, very positive angle. So all you have to do is pull back straight and it's going to cut. If you apply any downward pressure or downward angling, the cutting is going to be accelerated. So this is just uh, an outstanding knife in terms of, well, yes, it's thinly ground and the geometry of the, the cutting geometry is excellent, but the geometry of the edge to the handle is also excellent. And um, I think we need to uh, acknowledge that because it is a significant improvement, improvement over its inspiration. So this knife, the Finch Harvester was inspired by the Sodbuster style knife, a farmer's work knife. Um, here's one uh, from GEC, and here's another from GEC, two of my favorite Sodbusters. I have some cases that I also like, but this knife is based off of these knives, and the story goes like this. Uh, Spencer Marquardt, uh, who designed the Harvester, one half of Finch Knives, uh, his in-laws have a farm, and they all carry Sodbusters, for working on the farm. And he has over the years seen this and seen the sod buster in use. What is the sod buster? It's a very simple drop point with a bullnose uh, tip, a long straight, and then a very neutral handle. 
Uh, a real sod buster will have a very large pivot. I shouldn't say a real sod buster, but when you when you look at case knives, uh, they're bone sod busters. Uh, because of the the nature of bone, it, it it cracks easily. They can't do a pivot this large, so they have to do a smaller pivot in the bone. Uh, when you see the larger pivot, you know it's capable of greater work. And this is a work knife. Uh, so the harvester inspired by this, but you can see some obvious changes. And, and I mentioned an improvement before. And to me, the improvement is the blade angle. If you look at it like this, uh, the spines are, are aligned. And you can see the sod buster on top. This is the uh, 73 the GEC 73 has a straight edge and it and it's and it moves forward from the handle in line with the pivot. But when you look at the knife below, the Finch Harvester, you will see how much that blade dips down. And that that angle is what is the improvement. That angle is what accelerates cutting and uh, requires less effort from the cutter. So I'm really thrilled about this knife. I love I love the sod busters. So I love that this has that sort of historical um, inspiration. All that aside, it is an excellent flipper. I mean, it is smooth as silk and pops out super, super uh, rockets out, if you will. And then you have these bolsters. Well, what are bolsters for? Not just for looking good. Bolsters are there to add lateral strength. So if you're using your, your harvester to pry something, bad idea, but if you have to in a pinch, those metal bolsters over the tang of the blade, um, at least in theory and especially in uh, slip joint knives, though those large bolsters add to the lateral strength when you're prying or doing this sort of sideways motion. So I, I think that, uh, that this Finch knife is going to be very a very robust work knife, in addition to just being a charming and cool EDC. If you know Finch knives, you know that they have two sort of distinct, um, without coming right out and saying it, they have sort of two distinct lines. Uh, one that has the bolster and, and the bolster lock, which is essentially a frame lock. And then those that have uh, a flat top. Um, do I have one? Oh yeah, I do have one here. Like the uh, like the Cimarron, just a flat top material and a liner lock. So they have those two, and this one falls very nicely in that bolstered category. And I am crazy about it. I love Finch knives. Um, you know, probably if you've watched the show at all, that I love large, aggressive-looking tactical knives because th those are the things that really uh, I don't know. They touch my heart. But uh, those are the things I also like to carry. But what also touches my heart are cool little knives like this. And I, these are always secondary knives for me. Um, but they are also the knives that get the most use. So I love this Finch Harvester. I think you should check it out. They have, oh my God, they have it in a gorgeous, this is in a really nice canvas, green canvas micarta. They have it in a gorgeous like sunset bone. So I might have to just get a second one of these in that yellow bone color. So, okay. So since I left the Drifter, which is a beautiful snake wood, small Bowie knife with a outstanding blade that I, I wish they would make into a large fixed blade. Anyway, uh, I will show that next week. I left it on my desk at work, as I mentioned, and uh, I'm embarrassed. I can't show it right now, but I'll show it next week. So you can check that out. Uh, I highly recommend it. Yeah, this is a, thank you, Jim. Jim's pulling up a picture of it. And as you can see up top, they have, they they do that design. They do a new design and a new sticker for every knife. And they all have this really cool retro feel to them. I love it. You know me, I'm a sucker. I'm, a, I'm an old, I'm an old Italian man with nostalgia problems. And I see a design that looks like a old design from an era gone by that I, that I idolize. And and it, it makes and and that's what that's what Finch knife does for me. Like these knives, just make me wistful. Look at that. Look at that blue denim micarta. How cool! Now me personally, I, I'm I'm still loving my snake wood, and that's how I prefer this. But look at that. I mean, that is gorgeous. And then, as you know, all Finch knives come with that luminescent, um, or I should say, luminous badge on the handle. Very much a tip of the hat to the classic slip joint knives. Some people, uh, I call them killjoys, don't like that. 
but uh you know they can all go straight to hell no i'm just kidding i'm just kidding i really like that uh that finch uh badge and we were, we were talking about it the other night on the show and <clears throat> it was a, another polarizing issue all right, so that's it for the state of the collection. Uh, I have something else coming in this week that I'm very excited to show off, but I'll 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 leave you on tenter hooks about what that's going to be. Um, but let's get to the main topic today. Uh, but before we do, check out our Knife Junkie merch. Go to the knifejunkie.com/shop. You can find not only uh, Knife Junkie logo, wait, Knife Junkie logo. Uh, materials, but Jim has fashioned all of these super cool, designed all these really cool uh, different uh, t-shirts and products with different, uh, well, there's the Don't Take Dull for an Answer logo. There's the, uh, the the Knife Math logo. There's One Life, One Knife logo. There's all sorts of cool stuff that Jim has designed. So go check out the knifejunkie.com slash shop and uh, represent your your irrational love for knives with some of our merchandise. Okay, here we go. 10 slim and slender folders. Now, this used to be a prerequisite for me. And, and I'm thinking back, I'm like, why was it? Uh, and when was it? And I think it was about 15 years ago. I liked everything slim except for the, except for the gigantic cold steel uh, Vaquero Grande that I would carry sometimes. I liked everything slim and slender to fit into my pants because <laughs> in those days I was trying to impress. And, uh, <clears throat> so the, the, you know, the less in your pockets, the better. Uh, and, uh, I liked the slim and slender knives and, and sort of accumulated a bunch of them. And then over time I got more into the harder use, the beefier, um, kind of taking the, the cold steel ethos, but extrapolating it out into titanium and frame lockage and uh, and different steels and such. And the slim and slender knives kind of went by the wayside. But recently, with my midlife crisis, I've been trying to fit back into some of my old clothes, and I've taken note of some of my slim and slender knives. Now, I'm just kidding. Uh, midlife crisis, probably, uh, but I'm not trying to fit into my old clothes. Every once in a while, it comes up that I have to wear a suit, and I'm like, God, how did I gain so much weight since last time? But anyway. And, and I seem to have shrunk too. All right. So first up, probably for a long time, this was my, my favorite, most prized folder. And I still love this. And I still love the maker. This is the Sinkovich designed zero tolerance, zero four, five, two. This knife hits it all for me, gets it all for me, except for that checkered carbon fiber. I wouldn't mind uh, if I had a different handle scale on it, but long it's 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 greater than four inches in blade length which i love it is very sharp the action on this is incredible but look at that profile that's what really nailed it for me the long slender sleek stylish profile interesting thing about sinkovich um is that uh, uh dimitri sinkovich is that some of his knives look like this and then some of his knives have the opposite effect. This is long, slen, uh, long, slender, slim, classy. Some of his other knives are larger, more um, utilitarian looking uh, and, and just sort of different, but you can tell that they're Sinkovich designs and I, I, I haven't distilled out exactly what it is, uh, but I love them. Uh, he does a, a wine key that I would just, I'd love to have. What do I love about this knife? Besides it's uh, sleek and slender, which is why we're showing it right now, but it's sleek and slender, it's light, and it's big. That's the beauty part. You can carry a big knife and not feel like you're carrying a big knife with this. The uh, unlined carbon fiber slab makes it very light. Uh, no no weight relief on the, on the lock side, not necessary. And uh, that's S35VN. Ergonomically, that forward uh, bit of jimping is some of my absolute favorite. It reminds me a bit of the SOCOM Elite, where it's got a slightly downward uh, ramp there on the on the forward portion of the of the tang with jimping. It feels awesome in hand. So the first slim and slender knife for classy carry would be the old the old zero five four two. Okay, next up is not old; it is new. This is the Rockwall by Tactile Knives. Tactile Knives, 
is a company that branched out from Tactile Turn, the pen company, and they are known for their exquisite milling. I'm going to show this up close and see if we can see some of those milling lines in there. And uh, yeah, okay, there we go. That handle has all that really refined milling. It is a titanium liner lock, something I've been loving these days over the frame lock in that uh, the action is totally unimpeded by external pressure from your thumb or fingers when you're flipping. Same with the closing. This knife was designed to fit in the package of a five stick Wrigley's pack. Wrigley's is a gum from the old days and, and uh, it came in a pack this size. <laughs> That's what this was designed to do. So uh, the guys at uh, Tactile were thinking, how do, what makes a great EDC knife? And they thought about carry profile primarily. And uh, the carry profile of this, they're like, what do people carry in their pocket? Well, they carry gum. And uh, so this was made to fit that, that profile. So it is a three inch blade, very sharp and nicely pointy. Uh, I must say, I must add, um, but slim and slender and sleek and robust. So it fits in a small space. You could definitely carry this in your, in your skinny jeans and you'd be all the rage. They'd be like, was that knife made in Austin? You'd be like, yeah, man. And uh, here you go. It is a, it is perfect for that, uh, for that kind of carry. I really do love the, the rock wall. I love the, the, the look of the bear, the bear, bear. Bexar is how it's spelled, but their new slip joint. Uh, I've, I've been informed that B-E-X-A-R is actually pronounced bear, bear. I'm not sure, but that looks beautiful too. Slim, slender, Great materials, great build, American made, and will fit in any little uh, pocket you want it to. All right. Next up is the Finch Cimarron. We saw this a few moments ago. I love this little knife. It, and it's not so little. This is actually the largest of the Finch knives that I have. I think the Takuna might be slightly larger, but I don't have that one. Um, I would like to. Hint, hint. <laughs> so uh, the blade in the Cimarron fits completely in the handle, kind of like a, a Quaken style, uh, like the Burnley Bo Boker Burnley Quaken. Now let's see if we can get some focus on this. Is that too much to ask? Uh, so G10 liner lock. You've got that beautiful two-tone tone G10, yellow and gray, and just amazing, amazing action. This is a long, slender, and light blade, and yet it falls shut like a big heavy blade so it's on bearings of course really excellent action but i love how that blade fits completely in the handle so if you're if you want to talk slim and slender you make a slim and slender handle and then you make the blade fit 100 percent complete completely within it and uh and then you've got your perfect slender carry package. This, of course, has a really nicely tight, uh, sculpted titanium pocket clip and that really low profile flipper tab that I that I like a lot that doubles as a as a finger choil or the the inverse of a finger choil because it pops out. But it's it's jimped and is a great place for that finger to land, though. This is a one, two. Though this is a three and a quarter inch knife, it is small enough that it makes a great secondary back pocket knife. This will ride nicely next to my wallet if it's in my back right. Usually it's in my back left next to my bandana. And uh, just the slim and slender uh, nature of it allows me to carry this almost three and a half inch blade. So love the Cimarron from Finch Knife Co. And again, uh, that one is 154 CM. First one is S35. Second one, the uh, the Bexar is 20 CV. And then this right here is uh, uh, 154. I take it back, 14C28N. 14C28N. Okay, next up is one that you don't see much about. And, and this was only in production for maybe two years. And I think it is the coolest uh, of the police-esque, police-style knives. Now, this knife, when it came out, was sort of grouped in with the Spyderco police model because uh, its designer is a former police officer in Germany. And uh, so, and it has some of the same long, slender 
qualities that the that the Spiderco police model has. But this is not the Spiderco police. This is the Spiderco Uliza. Just an outstandingly gorgeous knife. I, I think one of the coolest Spidercos ever made. I rarely carry it, but I will never get rid of it. I, I just think I will never get rid of it. I distinctly remember when this came out. I don't know, 2013, 2014, something like that. I saw it and uh, I remember for some reason it was $174 because at the time that was prohibitively expensive. And, um, but I remember seeing it and thinking, oh my God, I designed that knife. Like I've already drawn that knife, like in my notebook a hundred times, you know, um, it just looked, it just resonated with me as something that uh, either I had already designed or something that I would design because of that recurve and because of the shape of that blade and the downward angle from the handle and the sort of pistol grip styled handle, uh, handle all of those angles to me reminds me of these kind of swords on the wall, like this uh, uh, Taliban right here um, from the Philippines. It, it looks like a folding version of that. And I had been going for that in my own sketchbook for for years and then i saw this come out and i was like oh my god i have to have this and i remember saying to my wife look at this oh my god and she looked at 174 dollars for a folding knife and i was like yeah it's crazy isn't it <laughs> and then i dropped the subject um but hollow ground recurved vg10 this thing is a, a pretty nasty knife i mean this is a a, a pretty tactical uh tactically sound design you've got a, a a four inch plus design you've got the recurve and then you've got this pistol grip setup so it takes very little if, you, if you've got the knife like this it takes very little to stab with it or thrust with it uh you know a straight bladed knife i'm going to use this sod buster which is weird but a straight bladed knife you have to do a lot more canting of your wrist to get the point where you want it to go if you're thrusting with it obviously you're not fighting with a with a sod buster, but we're just talking about a straight profile knife. Here you've got a curved profile knife. Uh, so you, you have to do a lot less in, ter in terms of changing your angle of your wrist to get that point where you want it to go. Seki City Japan construction. This knife, uh, this particular specimen has always been difficult. Uh, not, the, not the greatest action on this one, but I think that that is a problem with this particular knife. I don't think others uh, had that issue. All right. So that's the Spyderco Uliza, one of my favorite Spydercos of all time. Next up in the slim and slender but badass knife category here is the Ultratech from Mic Microtech. Uh, just a really sweet dagger design. And then, of course, you look at it without the, without the blade, and it is a rectangle. Essentially, it is a slim and slender rectangle. Fits nicely in the pocket with the pocket clip, and uh, it's it's about uh, a half inch thick, right? Yeah, a little slightly less than a half inch thick, so it's going to ride nicely in the pocket, especially with this dimension here, the, the, the dorsal to pectoral dimension. But then when you open it up and you see that slim and slender tanto blade with its symmetrical tapering, it, it sort of adds to the, the vibe of this as just being a capable, like to me, this is like an assassin's uh, uh, stiletto from the old days. It's just a slim, slender, pokey device. But they, something Microtech is capable of, and I don't quite understand it, and maybe some of you people out there who really get the sharpening thing can enlighten me, but on this Ultratech, if you do this, if you feel this angle from the from the central spine the medial spine to the edge it's a wedge it feels like an axe essentially it is a not a very wide blade and there's not a lot of room for this to thin out but somehow somehow with these thick behind the edge measure, measurements microtech still gets these damn knives like like screamingly stupidly razor sharp and i don't quite my 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 non mathematical mind doesn't quite understand how if it's that thick behind the edge, how can it be? How can it feel so thin uh, on the cutting? Now, again, I haven't sliced cheddar cheese with this knife, uh, but I have pull cut with this knife plenty of times, and and it pull cuts like a much thinner sort of hollow ground knife. So I'm not sure how they do that or how how, how that works. Maybe that's the overall 
thickness of the blade stock at play, but it doesn't, I don't know. Someone, someone help me out. Call the listener line 724-466-4487. Let me know how such a, a relatively wedge shaped geometry can actually be so keen and sharp. I'd like to know. Okay. Next up is a sort of departure. This is a large sucker, uh, but it is a it is in my drawer of very large folders, but it is by far the most pocketable of all of them. It is the five and a half inch bladed Frenzy from Cold Steel. Uh, this is a knife based on the on uh, Tojiwara. No, oh, God. So now I can't remember exactly what it's called, uh, but it's based on the. Um, in, uh, Ancient, not ancient, the, the, the old samurai Japanese knife intended for breaching helmets. It's for stabbing through helmets and killing people. Uh, and, and that's what this was based on. But I can't remember what the traditional Japanese knife was called. Now, when I saw this, when it was first released, the Cold Steel Frenzy, I thought Gununting. I'm like, OK, uh, Lynn Thompson, he's a Kali guy. Uh, they're making a Gununting here. But then I realized, well. I didn't realize I was enlightened through reading that uh, uh, Andrew Demko, uh, you know, his father owned a, an Aikido studio. So the Demko brothers grew up doing Aikido. So this has a Japanese inspiration, this, this helmet breaching knife. In any case, in terms of slim and slender, this thing has it nailed. It's about as slim and slender as the uh, Microtech. And yet it is... It is vastly longer. You've got a, what is this? Uh, you got about a six and a half inch handle. You have a five and a half inch blade, but it's all in the, in the, um, it's all in about a one inch thick package. I mean, it gets a little thicker here, but it's all very thin and slim. And this actually fits in standard, I don't know, 527 Levi's jeans pockets without without popping out the top. So so it it leaves about this much of the knife out and if you can manage if you can handle that you'll be able to carry a, a very large five and a half inch tactical knife in your jeans pockets. I love this this knife. The frenzy it, to me is such a crossover. It is what makes the large cold steel knives palatable to the general public, I think. Because, yes, it is five and a half inches of S35VN, no, CTS XHP steel and G10, but it really fits in the pocket easily. So you got the, you got the high quality materials and, and the audacious design all in a slim package. And uh, you pull that out for your average cutting task. People are going to pay attention. <laughs> so there you have it. That is the Cold Steel Frenzy, one of my favorite slim and trim knives next is also a cold steel and this is i'm going to show you a representative of the type it's the cold steel tie light and the tie light is based on the um, traditional italian stiletto so it's slim and slender and symmetrical and in this case with that crisp blade well it's not totally symmetrical uh, but it, that is a slim slender and sinuous blade and uh, fits this category well. Now, something I've always liked about the tie light, I had one, I carried one for years, uh, uh, just a regular Aus 8, regular straight bladed uh, uh, tie light. What I really liked about it was the was this measurement, the width. Uh, when it's folded up and in your pocket, this dimension from dorsal to pectoral is very slender. And that also allows you to reach into your, and plus with a low pro, file flipper you could reach into your pocket to get other stuff i was carrying this when i was an urban dweller you know i lived in new york city i never drove anywhere i took I walked or took the subway i like to walk a lot so i walked a lot but i had stuff in my pockets you know my car was my backpack in my pockets i couldn't just throw crap in my car and and and, and get it so uh, pocket space was at a premium so at the time, I carried my tie light a lot. I loved it. it. It it fit the bill. I had at the same time I had the vaquero, the the El Hombre, the four inch vaquero, and it was so much broader that in the pocket I loved it and I carried it a lot. But in the pocket it was less practical. So I found myself carrying the slim and slender tie light more. The one thing 
that always stuck in my craw a little bit with the tie light is the thickness. It is rounded. It is contoured uh, from here to here. These uh, in cross section, it is contoured and rounded. And I always kind of thought it didn't need that because it is short from dorsal to pectoral and rounded. It, it almost gives it a round cross section. Of course, it does. It does rectangle out. It does flatten out a little. Um, but in general, especially on a slim and slender handle, I want flat sides because there's going to be less rolling in the hand. If you're doing something rigorous with the knife and you really actually need to use it um, in such a way that, that the grip is 100% essential to getting the task done, I would like flat sides on a slim and slender knife. It, it just gives you more to grab onto. Kind of like this, uh, the difference here is right, is you, okay, the difference between the Cimarron and the and the um, tie light, you can see the Cimarron is even slenderer, uh, but the fact that it has flat sides makes it more stable in the handle on any sort of twisting or lateral move. Uh, but the tie light definitely had to be counted in the slim and slender folders because it, it has had such a storied place in my past. Next up, this is a cool one. I love this knife. Hardly ever carry it. Uh, I, when I first got it, I carried it a lot. But it's the Kershaw Lucha. Lucha. The long and lovely Lucha. Love this knife. It is just beautiful. That clip point blade is unique. It is different. But it is a clip point. That swedge. It's that weird swedge that does it. Uh, but this is a long and slender knife. If you look at it, the handle is one, two, three, four, five. Five and a half inches long. You've got a four and a quarter inch blade. What is this? One, three, four and a half inch blade. It is a long and slender knife. And I got to say, I've, I've had a number of uh, butterfly knives in my day, but this is definitely the highest quality butterfly knife I've ever had. I've had a lot of martial arts store butterfly knives and they're, they're cheap and, um, it does make a difference, I got to say. So my wife and I used to have a butterfly knife, before we had kids. We had a butterfly knife on our table. And, you know, our evening ritual, sit down, have some wine and some other stuff and whatever. And it always required a bit of a knife to, like, open things or sort things. And nothing was, was more gratifying than to see my cute and lovely wife sit down at the couch and do that with a butterfly knife and then open up a bottle of wine or whatever she was doing with it. So um, the Lucha is an awesome knife. If you have a Craving or a Jones for a, uh, a high quality butterfly knife, but you don't want to totally break the bank, I I really recommend the Lucha. Uh, to me, <clears throat> I do like Bally songs, but having this, I'm like, I'm not a Bally song fanatic and I'm not a big flipper guy. So I don't need to go beyond this. And I, I, I do understand that, the will and the desire to go beyond this, believe me. Uh, but for me and my purposes, the Kershaw Lucha, the long and slender Kershaw Lucha is just fine for me and my butterfly knife uh, cravings. Plus, I can't carry them legally, so it's kind of a buzzkill. All right, second to last is a long and slender knife with historical significance. This is the uh, Spiderco Patata. The Patata is a sort of... Um, well, it's 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 the patron knife of Sardinia, island off of Italy, and this is the knife. Uh, this is the blade style and the the knife style that uh, is traditional to that island. Of course, this is a modern interpretation. Uh, Sal Glesser did his modern interpretation design of the classic patata. And then had it made in Italy. This is an Italian made, a Maniago made uh, spider co. And it is, it is incredible. I got to say, like, first of all, let's start with the blade. If you look at the blade from the spine, you see that gorgeous distal taper. And it comes to such an acute point. How do they do this in a factory setting without jacking it up? It just seems like that super fine point would require really, really, really uh, attentive people. I don't know. I don't know. They they nailed it. Uh, but that blade is long and slender. And when you look at it, it doesn't look big. That's a four inch blade. 
solid four inch blade. But with that taper from this sort of uh, belly point to the tip is so slender that it makes it look shorter than it is. Um, this is a knife that I don't carry as much as I would like to for fear of that tip. <laughs> I have I have bad luck with tips. I can be clumsy with very nice things and um, <laughs> I don't want to break it. So I don't carry it so much. But since it's a Spyderco from the ethnic line and it's the ethnicity is Italian, I got to keep it. Not only that, but I just think it's beautiful. I think it's a beautiful design. And that thin slicey blade, when I do use it, is outstanding. All right, the Spyderco Patata. And by the way, they have a small version of that. It's a three and a quarter inch blade, I believe, called the Patarese. Patarese, which I guess just means small patata. All right, last one on this list. Uh, I'm mentioning it last, not because it's my favorite or my most prized, but because it's pointing in the direction of where my current, I don't know, we'll say the next couple of months uh, little obsession is headed. And that is... Um, I'm loving the Savivis these days. I don't know how this happened. Uh, not that it's a bad thing. Not that there's anything wrong with it. Uh, but I've just been digging the Savivis. And I think it has a lot to do with how thin these damn blades are sharpened. I mean, okay, so this is a this is a hollow ground blade. This is the Asticus, a gift from my brother-in-law. Very thoughtful, awesome gift from my brother-in-law last Christmas. And I can't really show you with this camera, but it's a hollow ground blade. and I swear to God, it slips through atoms. It is, it slips between atoms when you cut. It's so sharp. It's so thin behind the edge here. And um, well, I really love it. So this measurement, dorsal to pectoral, is not as slender as some of these, but in cross section, man, it is very thin. And the steel liners are heavily weight relieved there, as you can see. So this thing is just light and facile in hand. I mean, it is just a light, thin knife. A lot of these um, are good for, but this one especially, are good for in the waistband carry because it's so slender. And sometimes, well, lately in the waistband carry has been fixed blades. But, you know, if you've been following me at all, you know that I frequently will carry folders uh, in the waistband, especially in the summertime. And uh, this one is great for it the uh the Savivi Asticus. All right, let me just rattle these off real quick and uh let me align them a little better. All right, first up in the slim and slender survey of my collection is the Zero Tolerance 0452 CF. Next we have the Rockwall by Tactile Knives. Here we have the Cimarron by Finch Knife Company. We have the Uliza by Spyderco, the Ultratech Dagger in uh, uh from Microtech the Frenzy from Cold Steel, the Tie Light from Cold Steel, in this case, the Chris, the Spyderco Lucha, the uh, Spyderco, well, a lot of Spydercos here, the Spyderco uh, Patata. Oh, I call this a Spyderco Lucha. I'm sorry, the Kershaw Lucha, the Spyderco Patata. And then last, but certainly not least, the very cool and funnily named Civivi Asticus. Slim and slender. Is this a requirement for you uh, in your everyday life? Are you a city dweller? Uh, you know, like Ray, everyday city carry. He's He's got to get out of his apartment, get on the subway, walk to work, whatever it is. He's, you know, pocket space is at a premium. Is this slim and slender measurement thing a thing for you? Let me know. Leave a comment below. Call the listener line 724-466-4487 and let us know. Uh, if you want to get notes from this here podcast, just go to thenifejunkie.com slash 269. That's this episode number 269. You can watch the episode, uh, which is what you're doing right now. So you probably don't have to do that, but you can get notes there too. So uh, be sure to like, comment, subscribe. And check us out on Thursday, tomorrow night, Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern. We have a good old time on Thursday Night Knives, and you can join the conversation on your very own phone and come on the show with us. You can also listen live, uh, not live, you can also listen <laughs> audio on the podcast with your favorite podcast app, as you can see right here. All right, people. So uh, that's it for this edition of the Knife Junkie Podcast Supplemental Midweek Edition. I feel like I've talked long enough, so I will let you go. But thank you so much for listening. It's so greatly appreciated. And I know Jim 
working his magic behind the switcher appreciates it too. So for him, I am Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.